really excited to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm excited to, uh, to announce our presenter for today. He's a, not only a brilliant uh, clinician, but also a very close friend. Uh, Dr. Randy Cohen, who's the um, Associate Director of Athletics for the Cat Medical Services out at University of Arizona. Uh, Randy's been there since 2001. Prior was at Purdue and uh, Notre Dame, both a PT, a Doctor of uh, Physical Therapy, as well as an ATC. And Randy's going to be presenting on a, a really um, a special topic close to our heart. And what we believe um, here at Tracer is a, a is really a, a integral and critical part of future clinical modalities and delivery of clinical applications to our patients and engagement of brain and body. So uh, he's going to be speaking on integrating neuromechanical measures into concussion and orthopedic rehabilitation. And I'm going to go ahead and just kick it over to Randy now. Once Randy wraps his presentation up, we'll jump in and do a brief uh, Tracer presentation for about 10 minutes. And then we'll open it up to the group for question and answer. But uh, feel free to use your chat button throughout and uh, ask any questions, or monitoring questions. So if anybody has questions, comments, uh, please feel free to go ahead and, and present those and we'll get to them uh, throughout, you know, you know, throughout the uh, Tracer presentation as well as the Q&A. So Randy, go ahead and kick it off, buddy. All right, well, thanks everybody. Yeah, I apologize for last week too. And, and this week's been a little hectic too. And, you know, I'm having the opportunity to be right in the middle of a huge antibody research um, project with COVID and as the university is doing and we've been in our one of our using one of our athletic facilities at one of the sites where we're trying to do six thousand we're actually gonna end up doing six thousand antibody tests um, within five days. So we've been running around like a, like like crazy people helping and all of our athletic trainers have been integral part in managing it and actually our athletic trainers and our and the ones who work in our club sports and our dance program and R O T C and now we just got to need more help so we we jumped in and got a bunch of the athletic trainers from the high school community jumping in. So um, it's probably time to be to do what we do as a profession because um, we have great people on the front line doing great work. So those of you out there, I you know, my hats off to you. So I appreciate what you do. But no, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, this you know, integrating kind of neural mechanical measures and really kind of it's all process of, of how we learn and how we do activities and, and how do we train and what are we doing and it's some I got some new research and I'm not going to go over a lot of it in detail but I'm going to present it to you and I think everybody needs to look at some of this new research and see what we're out there to see how we really what are we doing to rehab for concussions and rehab for orthopedic uh, injuries and are we doing them efficiently as we can to prevent further injury and to get their function back to normal so um, I don't have any financial conflicts. This is this is me in a nutshell. If you have a slide of who you are, so this is kind of me and my daughters, and I mountain bike a lot, and I like to ski, and uh, I got a great staff that I can do these things, and they do all the work for me, and I get all the credit. Um, and um, I like to spend time in the desert and the mountains. So, to start out, we, we, you know, one thing we like to start to understand is kind of this motor program theory, and Schmidt was the first one who kind of you know you really kind of structured this. Um, but you know, you have a set, you know, a set of motor commands that are pre-structured at executive level, and they define essentially the details of the skill that we do. Um, and they're generalized rules that you know generate the spatial and temporal muscle patterns to produce specific movements. But we got to understand this is an open feedback loop process, and that's where I'm going to really spend a lot of time about about understanding that open feedback loop process. So Schmidt says basically there's four things that are stored. You know, after you know, you, you know, in memory, that after you generate a uh, movement pattern, the proprioception of the limb and the trunk, the response, the force and speed, uh, the sensory consequences of the response, which contains the information and how the movement felt and felt. I'm going to really talk about look and sound. So those are kind of the key components that we want really want to talk about and see how we figure that out um, when we're doing activity. And the outcome of that movement, you know, contains information that you know, actual about the outcome movement, the, the knowledge of the results, what happened after you did that movement, and what was the knowledge and the outcome from it. And that's the motor program that's set in the brain. So if you kind of if you go here, simplify what happens, we, we have a stimuli that occurs, we sense or see it, um, uh, we recognize the stimuli, we reflectively cognitive react, we move our feet, trunk, and our head to a correct position, and then our hands or our feet do something, right? That's, what, that's kind of what we do, but that's not what we really do. Here's what we do is, you get, a, you, you, you get, you sense a stimuli, okay? One of our senses, something happens. 
Well, your brain automatically predicts the future, okay? It grabs the motor program based on the senses that kick in, and it starts that, it starts that uh, motor program. And it actually starts that motor program even before all the input is collected. That's how quick we can do things, how quick reactions are. And we can talk about, we'll talk about some specific sports examples. So it's like really how quickly that, you know, it, pre so it predicts it before, oh, oops, I hit a slide, I didn't want to do that. Um, I want to move the little thing out of the way. It predicts, you know, it, what goes on before it happens. And it starts to do activity. When that motor program is already starting to move before we even have all those senses taking all that information in, your, your cerebellum and your brain in general will collect, collect a bunch of other feedback changes, okay? So what it does is it receives neuroreceptors, mechanoreceptors, you know, to start to change that action if it needs to change it or move it forward. While we're doing that, it also gets, gets a bunch of reflex actions, and it gives reflex actions back, right? So you have, you have things like your vestibular spinal reflex that actually, you know, it gets, sends information back for stability, right? the stability of your trunk. It also gets information, you get information back about how much tone you need of, of the muscles to be able to produce the amount of force or have the stability it needs to do that. So it needs that co-contraction, and, and you get the co-contraction. You get the co-contraction. If you start to lose your balance off, you get co-contraction back the opposite direction. Okay? You also get, um, you get just vestibular ocular reflex, right? That's gaze stabilization. You're locking your eyes on something while you're moving. So your eyes have to be locked on while you're moving, and you, you're, you get the reflex from your inner ear what your, how your eyes are actually tracking something. When you actually track something, then you're getting ocular motor feedback so your brain can see, sends information back. So actually what you can do there is you actually predict the future. So you have, the, you have, a, you have a stabilized vestibular ocular reflex. The ocular motor system gives information about predicting what's going to happen in the future, not what is happening at that time, because if you actually do it at that time, you are actually you're 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 ready you're ready too late to do what we need to do, and then you have kind of that visual emotional spatial spatial processing, um, you know that visual spatial processing that is crucial kind of to the management of the of the environment that you're interacting with. So you're constantly having this environmental change that you need to have this interaction visual spatial where you are in space that proprioception where you are and where you need to be. So it's giving that, that feedback loop, right? That comes through. Why these are all happening, you have to have other reflexes, the vestibular colic reflex, which is stabilizes the neck. So it's, a, it's an actual reflex that stabilizes the neck to have a stable platform so you can have vestibular ocular reflex, so you can have ocular, the ocular motor system can give information, can encode information and, and, brought, and, and, and then understand the information that it's, in, it's encoding. You need to have all that system working while you have normal autonomic nervous system, uh, you know, uh, action. So that means your heart rate needs to be managed. You need your blood pressure, your pupil reaction. You need to have that all happen. So if you move too quickly, you don't get a blood pressure. So you go from you know, down to up, you don't get a blood pressure. You got to have blood pressure changes. So you keep the correct blood flow to the brain so it can keep moving at the speed it needs to. Your heart rate needs to increase to increase blood flow to get to the muscles and the brain to keep the tone and everything it needs to do. And you need to have that when you have your normal energy system to keep doing that again and again and again and again. And you need to do all that without any interference, okay, without noise, which we call noise. And, and we're going to talk about noise a little bit and then what noise is. But it's this, you know, it, you've got to keep doing that again and again. So let's, let's use this as an analogy of sports. So a baseball, you, know, you have an outfielder, and the baseball, you know, baseball hit by, you know, it, you know at home plate, if your baseball gets hit. As soon as the ball hits the bat, you already have a good outfielder who's done this again and again. He's got the motor program. He or she, if baseball or softball, are already running to where the ball is going to be, not where the ball is. They're not watching it where it's, where it's landing. They hear the sound when it gets when it's hit off the bat. So the bat, you get to you hear the sound of how, it's, you know, how it goes off the bat, okay? They see the angle of where the bat hit it. They see the trajectory of the ball coming off the bat, okay? And they see the speed of the ball coming off the bat. But you don't cognitively process any of that information. If you actually are looking for that kind of action coming off, 
the ball's already behind you. That is a motor program that is set by repetition, doing something again and again and again. Then you're running to where the, where the ball was hit. You're going back. You're running to the warning track. You hit the warning track. The warning track is a different surface than the regular grass you are in the outfield. That's a feedback loop that you get from the tone of your feet, the angle of your, of the angle of your ankle when it hits, if the warning track's raised, elevated. You hit that. You go back. You, you feedback. You know from your motor program that, oh, when I get this change in the surface I'm on, I'm at the warning track. Your motor program then tells you where's the ball going to be by the fence. Then you jump. You put the mitt where the ball is going to be. And when the ball, as soon as the ball hits, you close the mitt. Okay? That is not a thought-out process. That is, a, that is a motor program that is from repetition, repetition, repetition. Okay? That has to be reflexive to be as good as we are at things we're doing, everything in life. Not to say a high level and a high level athlete. You need to have those things again and again without interference. Okay? And oh, why by the way, when you're when you're running, you need to have trunk stability. So if you start to step, start to slip a little bit, and you start to you start to slide a little bit, and you start to go like you're going to fall off, you, what you need to do is you need to catch your balance. So you have your figure spinal reflex that kicks into print you from falling over, and then but you're continuing to run while you're doing it. Then you need to know exactly how far to jump to get the ball. You need to back to how far to extend your net. Well, by the way, when you're doing that, as soon as you catch the ball, you turn around and you already are thinking the process. Oh, wait a minute. Somebody was tagging up at second base. I need to throw the ball home. That's a process of a thought process that you have to have, that you already have to be able to catch the ball, step, come down, and be able to make your next throw. So you need to do it again with the next process. And you need to do it again and again without, without, again, without interference. So what is interference? Interference is anything that messes with that process. Interference is pain, um, you know, for a concussion. It could be a headache. It could be sensitivity to noise, uh, visual issues, ocular motor, you know, encoding or decoding of ocular motor information that you have. It could be a, a, a deficit in your vestibular ocular system, okay? It could be, you know, it could be, you know, after concussion, sensitivity to light. You know, you, you, you slows down your process, changes your process. It could be fatigue or lack of energy. That could be from sleep issues. That could be general system issues at the, you know, that happen at the end of the day. It could be, that could be food. That could be, do you have the energy system available to readily feed the brain and the, and the body to be able to do these things again and again and again, okay? It could be general end of the day. You're just fatigued at the end of the day. You're not as good as you were at the end of the day or when you're fatigued or the end of a, you know, the end of a, um, you know, an activity. At the end of the game, you know, are you as good as you are at the beginning of the game? Do you have that system ability to do it when it's fatigued? And have you practiced and, and you have done that? If you're a concussion, is it, is it basically cognitive fatigue at the end of a, of a processing? So can you do it again? Again, processing is the information you get. Do you have a, is, is, it, is the processing speed quick enough to recognize something to actually get the body to move to where it needs to be? So cognitive speed, we measure that on right now. We measure it on you can measure cognitive speed on neurocognitive tests. You can sit at a computer and measure you know in cognitive processing speed. But does that processing speed actually get the body to move? Does it get the feet to move where they need to be? You process the information quickly, but then can you get the the information to the feet to move your body in the quickest way it needs to do? Do you recognize the recognition of the information that you have? You have the same recognition. Are you encoding new information that is a change in the motor program to alter it a little bit so you actually do something a little bit different, okay? And is your recall speed the same? Can you recall what you've learned previously or something that messed up that, that recalling all that cognitive processing? Chronic injury, overuse injury, surgery, all those can, can, mess with your, can, have that, can you recall that motor program of your brain to get that activity to go? Can you do all that Without, without balance deficit, without the vestibular spinal, you know, you know, deficit. We know with a concussion that you, 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 if you stand and you, and you do, and you, and you do sway testing, right? So we do those. We have people stand and we measure sway on force play, so we do tandem stand, or we do those type of things when we talk about balance. Well, balance is not a static activity, okay? Balance is never static. When in life as humans do we ever 
stand perfectly still and care if we sway or not. Probably the only time we do that is when we're doing some kind of test, right? We don't care if we sway. You know, we don't try to lock our can think, I'm going to stand perfectly still and not sway. Okay, I'm going to stand in the stance and try to keep my balance. We never do that. Balance is a dynamic activity. Can you move, stop up, stop and change direction? Can you move and, and the ground slips underneath you and you re-catch your balance? Okay? Can you, can you walk without being wobbly and stumble and fall over? When you walk, if you have balance deficits, do you open up your base of support so you're actually walking with your feet wider apart? So you're walking with your feet wider apart to keep your balance a little better because when you walk with your feet closer, you, 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 you're unstable. Can you stop on a dive and change direction? Or do you get extra sway where your trunk sways one way when you're trying to cut back? So your ability to decelerate and change direction decreases. So when you do that, you change things. And I'll talk about that in a minute, change angles and, and, and joint angles and, and muscle tone and things like that that possibly cause you risk of injury. Proprioception, okay? So do you're getting that neuromechanical, neuromechanical receptor feedback. And is your brain processing the way it should, okay? Are you doing this with normal autonomic you know, nervous system regulation? And if you have an injury, if you have a concussion, is it a primary autonomic nervous system dysregulation or a secondary? Which means is if it's primary, that means the injury occurred, portion of the brain that got injured could affect the autonomic nervous system. Or is it secondary? You're deconditioned. You used to exercise all the time. Now you, you don't exercise, so you've developed an exercise intolerance. So when you try to exercise, your autonomic nervous system doesn't have good regulation. Other things can affect the secondary autonomic nervous system regulation too. Lack of sleep. So do you have a do you have a sleep issue from something like a concussion or stress? It's not you discuss it. Could be stressful in your life. You don't sleep very well. So when you sleep, don't sleep very well. You have an autonomic nervous system dysfunction. Checking heart rate variability on people. Do you have a good heart rate variability? Have you checked your heart rate variability is within your, within your normal range to see that you're able to do these activities at a high high level? Anxiety causes heart rate, autonomic nervous system dysregulation, depression, post-traumatic stress. Now, we, we, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, we call it this disorder, but there's some people who talk about it. It, it, puts, it shouldn't be called a disorder because it's just a dysregulation of your post-traumatic stress because your reaction to stress is a normal. It's a fight or flight, right? It's, it's parasympathetic, you know, sympathetic versus parasympathetic. You should have some kind of equilibrium balance between those two. Post-traumatic stress probably is you're in a sympathetic state more. You don't have that parasympathetic state to bring you back down to get you in equilibrium. So people with post-traumatic stress disorder really is a dysregulation, could be a dysregulation between the, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. That will affect your autonomic nervous system regulation. That affects your ability to have all this other stuff, balance, proprioception, cognitive processing, affects all of that. And then the future, we have to look at this gut-brain interaction because we have a lot of, this is, this is a really an area that is untapped. We need to start to understand that. We know that the gut has an effect on the brain, um, you know, and we know, you know, we know the brain has an effect on the gut. And so that's why if you get, if you, part of a migraine is you get nauseous, right? So you know that. So there is this interaction there that's going to have a lot of future being looked at it. So, so if you look at what we mean by the census, so, you know, you know, great, you know, we always talk about, you know, great quarterbacks, when, you know, when, uh, when they're in the pocket and they feel this pressure on the backside, they inherently step up forward. They take one step forward, the defensive end or the rush linebacker blows past them, and they, and, and they, and they, have, a, they have a chance to make that play. Inexperienced quarterbacks don't make that step up, and they get their, they, the great, you know, great rush guys knock their arms down, and they fumble the ball, right? So great quarterbacks. What is that? We all oh, that's a sixth sense. They just know, no, that's not a sixth sense. That's actually our senses, okay? So what is it, though? It's a subconscious understanding. It, it, could be, it could be smell. It could be hearing. You hear the, the person coming behind the great quarterback, hear them coming behind them. It's pressure. It's, it's, it's touch. So touch is air pressure. So if, you're, if, you're, if, you're deep, if, you're, if your offensive lineman, your left tackle, is, is, pressure, is, is coming in pressure, they're pushing air on you, you can feel that a great quarterback probably feels that on their body and then hears that behind them and steps up in the pocket to be able to make that throw. No great quarterback can say, oh, I felt it. Uh, you know, they can they, they say, yeah, I sensed it behind me. And they're like, oh, what does that mean? Well, that means actually their senses have been so fine-tuned in their motor program that they can, they can sense and they step up in the pocket when they feel that. 
That is a motor program that's set in the brain that's not a thought-out process. If you think about these motor processes, you've already, you've already lost, you, you lost your space, right? So you need to understand all these things. You know, you know, these are all the senses that you have to have, and you got to understand. And you have to train them at the level. You have to train them um, early on to get them to go back to what their normal activity is. So let's talk about vision really quick. Vision is a really interesting uh, concept, um, you know, that, that we, 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 we have to understand about two things. We have focal vision. Which is this is this is um, Bill Padula, some work he's out of the East Coast. Bill Padula talks about conscious and preconscious, and he's one of the people. And so conscious is that detailed discrimination identification that's slow, okay. But the preconscious, the ambient vision, is proactive. It predicts the future. It gives you spatial orientation and balance, and it's rapid speed. This preconscious, you know, preconscious ambient vision. Is not something we know we recognize. It's from it, it's already giving information to the brain, or either giving information to the brain that we don't recognize are there. So there's a cool concept, and you can look this up. There's there's some references on on YouTube where they actually they actually pay people. And this is how we got to understand that our brain processes information as a, as a as a human and as an athlete. So and this is not just doing athletic activity. This is driving a car. Experienced drivers, if a car comes into their lane, starts to come over. You're already swerving before you even necessarily recognize, hey, there's a car coming over my lane. You caught it out of the side of your eye. You barely saw it. You've already swung into the lane, just swung out of the way. Good drivers will swing just enough to get out of that angle of that car and not you know, slam their car over and, and jackknife and, and, and roll their car, or they won't actually slide and go into the car next to them and hit the car next to them. Why? That's processing the information so quick that we just turn just enough to get out of the way, to swerve out of the way, to not get hit by that car, but not smash into the car next to us. Okay? That is a processing of so fast, you didn't think about that. But your brain processed that information from the visual field, from the vision it's getting. So blind sight is just really a cool concept. And it's the ability of people have cortical blindness, so they don't, can't see anything. They're, perfect, they're completely blind in front of them due to some kind of lesion of impairment of the visual cortex, that's a V1, okay? Um, but it's ability, you know, for them to respond to visual stimuli that they don't consciously see, okay? So this behavior can be guided by sensory information, which there's no conscious awareness. So what they have is they have videos. They have a person completely blind. You can do all this stuff, and they cannot see anything in front of them. But they're walking down a hallway, and they have obstacles in the hallway, and those people just take steps and walk around these obstacles without walking into them. And if you told them, why did you move out of the way of something, they'll say, I didn't move out of the way of something. I just moved out. I just, I just walked, I walked down the hall. They don't consciously realize that their brain is getting information from their eyes that they don't cognitively see. And so that just gives us another understanding of when you get this motor program of doing high, high level sport activity, we are getting information that we don't even recognize we get. But you can mess up that process by doing, by, by, and sometimes we probably do it in rehab. And if you especially get it, it gets messed up by injury. And so, um, so that's kind of how you have to think of where we got to retrain the motor program. So, um, you know, rehabbing is brain rehab. So we got to understand neuroplasticity. So right. So if we have injury, you know, it's a, you know neuroplasticity, or even just building, you know, building on some um, some neurons. It's the ability to reorganize and form neural neural connections. Okay. It can be you know axonal sprouting, um, which is getting new pathways, or it, it can actually be in, in enhancing the nerve. We'll talk about that in a minute. Or it can be re, you know regeneration or compensating sprouting. The bottom section down here. We would rather, after injury, to try to do everything possible to get regeneration, to get compensating sprouting, because this isn't as efficient as this. So you want to try to get to do activities early on to try to get the regeneration, okay? That's why you want to do early activity, uh, functional activity, as quickly as possible after injury, uh, such as injury. So neuroplasticity is you get the synaptic strength increase. Um, you know, you get you get the receptors in in in, in the uh, you know the receptors at the at the junction get improved. They get you get that synaptic strength. You get increase in dendrite branching, and then you get thickening of the myelination. Those are what you want to kind of. That's what this neuroplasticity is. In all activity, 
that we do repetitive stuff increases neuroplasticity. So, you know, basically, you know, you want to do change in connective among the other the neurons. Um, you know, the key to get this working is doing dual tasking. You want to do multiple things together to get this feedback, you know, to get these to increase neuroplasticity. Now, we, if you're doing, if, you're, if you're, you want the neurons you know, to be efficiently to work better, not just even just get muscle strength. So, you know, one of the things that's interesting that I, I really kind of wonder about is um, if you're doing activities that incorporate other portions of your brain to start and do that activity, you're actually, and there's some data I'm going to show in a minute, that you're actually becoming inefficient. You're causing neuroplasticity in other areas of the brain that fire at the same time you're trying to do the activity you're doing. So if you're sitting there and you're doing quad sets and you're watching the muscle fire, you're actually getting the optic nerve to, 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 to contract at the same time the quad is firing. You're getting a motor program set up in your brain to actually get that portion of the optic nerve to fire when the muscle fires. And there, I'll show you some data in a minute by, uh, by, by Dustin Grooms and some, some others that actually had shown this. Um, so you're actually getting inefficiency. So you actually want to have somebody doing some kind of dual tasking when they're doing their activity early on so you don't get inefficient muscle programming, okay? So even things like, you know, it's really interesting. I know BFR is, a very, is really popular now, blood flow restriction activity. But blood flow restriction is tricking the brain to hypertrophy without getting this neuroplasticity. So are you causing inefficient movement patterns by doing too much you know, you know, blood flow restriction? We don't know. That is, that is preliminary. It's really early thinking about it. But if you're doing blood flow restriction, you sure better do a lot of dual tasking, getting that, say you're doing it on the quadriceps, you better do dual tasking, not concentration activities of that quadriceps immediately when you're doing it at the same time so you're not getting inefficient neuro, you know, uh, neural patterns. Right? That's just a, that's just a tidbit I'm going I'm to mention. So research done by these young, you know, a couple of young, Gary's not so young, um, Gary's on, um, I apologize, but Gary's not so young compared to the young researchers, really understanding this neural coupling. And I'm not going to go through these, but there's, there's been years, there's been quite a few years that this has been coming out. Gary's had some stuff, and Buzz Swenick has had some stuff years ago where they looked at the relationship between neurocognitive functioning and, and ACL injuries, um, you know, non-contact uh, ACL injuries and neurocognitive scores and show there. Gary and him have done that. Um, reaction time, neural kind of in, 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 lower, in, in lower extremity injuries. Um, now we have Dustin Grooms and others have been doing things about neuroplasticity, looking at functional MRI. Um, I'll let you read all this, but this is a, this is a it's very interesting research study right here where they looked at post-ACL reconstruction, and you actually, on the side you had, you had inefficient brain patterns for basically looking at fMRIs, where you lit up an area such as the ocular motor areas after, you know, the visual motor areas have, have increased activity in the functional MRI post-ACL, which may be from the rehab, not from the injury, but the rehab you're doing, you're, you're getting the ocular motor section, you know, ocular motor portion of the brain firing early on. Um, so more of these, you know, Gary and Dustin put it as a as a as a, uh, a a research study here. Where they looked at, you know, current uh, post concussion clinical assessment may not be adequate to identify the neuromechanical, re you know, um, you know, responsiveness to the rapid changing. Um, and this is probably one of the reasons why we have rich and lower extremity injury. Another one here. This is Gary. We actually looked at Tracer and looked at he could predict from. From, from looking at from looking at results from Tracer, who had history of two or more concussions? And it was a pretty high prevalence he was able to predict that. So if you look at, you know, this, you know, you know using Tracer, um, this is what Gary looked at here. He was able to predict by looking at reaction time and deceleration. He could predict people who had two or more concussions um, by, by the reaction time and the deceleration. And if you think, what is deceleration? Deceleration is, is vestibular spinal, right? This deceleration is balance. He said, you know, not standing, but it's static. It's the ability to stop on a dime and not get over trunk compensation because you don't have, you know, your balance isn't back dynamically. So you get a sway, but you don't get a sway standing perfectly still. You get a sway when you plant and try to change direction. So you get that, you get that added, you get that added sway moving over the top. So you get that, you get that, that occurs. 
So if you, um, so when we look at the lateral agility on Tracer right here, you look at right to left differences. You can show your right to left differences that show up. So what's our hypothesis of, 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 of risk of lower extremity after a concussion? Well, the data shows that we are at risk for lower extremity injury after a concussion. Well, why is that? So, you know, think about the things that we can know and we can measure with, you know, when you have you know, after concussion. We know vestibular spinal. We know sway, okay? That's your proprioception of where you know your body and space. We know your ocular motor system doesn't track as well. Your ocular motor system, if you look at convergence and in, 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 in divergence of the eye, convergence and divergence of the eye have to do with, you know, with, with the ability to, to draw in, look out, pull back. It gives you where you are in space, your proprioception. It gives you depth perception, okay? The ocular motor system we know gives you depth perception. Your processing of information you, we know gives you reaction time. How quickly can you react to something? <laughs> okay, so if you have all those things that we know after concussion that can begin have deficit. So how do those all go together? Well, let's start out with vestibular spinal. So you're in, you're a non-contact, you're a soccer player, and you're going to plant and cut and change direction and kick a ball. If you have proprioception, if you have, if you have a vestibular spinal changes, if you have balance changes, if you go to plant your foot and you start to your trunk sways. You just change their joint reaction force that you that you need. You could possibly cause you need a pivot shift. Okay, if your if your if your depth perception is a little bit off, when you plant your foot, as soon as you plant your foot, your your brain's automatically saying, "I need to fire my quadriceps with this much force." As soon as I get the foot come in contact with the ground, because that's how I'm going to not get a flexion or extension moment. Immediately I hit the ground. That gives me a solid base to plant and kick with my other foot. Okay, so it knows exactly how much tone, how much muscle firing to fire to not get a flexion or extension moment. Okay, so if I, my depth perception says the ground is right there and it's all subconscious, as soon as I hit the ground, my, my, my muscles and my quad's going to contract. If the ground is off, if you're off millimeters, if you go to plant your foot and hit your foot, if the quadricep fires milliseconds early, so the quadricep fires, it actually, when your quadricep fires in, a, in an open chain kinetic, position, it actually puts your ACL in a taut position, right? Because it anterior you translates your knee a little bit. So if you get your ACL to a taut position, if your anterior you translate by your quad contraction, then your foot hits the ground, not at the same time, delayed, you're now, you're now hitting the ground when your ACL is in a taut position, and you can possibly pivot shift your knee. So then you're, you're get to, you get your pivot shift, okay? Or if your reaction time is also processing all that information, your your reaction time is off, and you're and you think the ball is where it's going to be, okay? Or your appropriate section is off. You think the ball, and at the last second, the ball is a little farther out. So you reach you reach out, extend extend farther to hit the ball. You change the angle of your knee or your hip and all the, you know everything that we monitor because you had to reach because your prediction of where the ball was going to be to hit it was not there. It was a little bit off, okay? Or you have a longer reaction time to process the information. It changes. So that whole system gets out of whack by things we know we can measure with concussion now. And we know we measure those also not with concussion, but post-injury, post-surgery, those type of things. Okay? So here's some of these different things. If you add cognitive challenges to functional activity, our cognitive challenges decrease our ability to do functional activity. Here's a, here's a research subject that a research project that they looked at. They looked at neurocognitive challenges of hop when you did um, when you add neurocognitive to hop testing, and the added cognitive challenge was a, you know was apparent as participants failed to jump as far and as quickly with traditional hop when you added a neurocognitive component to it. Add neurocognitive, you don't you you, you can't function as well. So if you have you have to work those together. Another one here about eccentric and brain activity. This is a, this is a, with the left lead. Um, Lindsay and Adam have done some great work here about brain activity and, and, and using eccentric exercise. I'll let you read that. So if you look at the functional activity of what you want to do when you go back to functional activity, you want to make sure that you're actually incorporating the things we know, how we train the processing of the brain and the eyes into functional activity. So using smooth pursuits, saccade, the VOR, the stimulocular reflex, the VOR cancellation, Cognitive act activation, you know, vestibular spinal system. While you're doing cardiovascular exercise, 
while you're doing core stability exercise, while you're doing basic PRE exercises, when you're doing functional rehab and sports-specific activity, and you do that early on. So you work dynamical visual acuity while you're doing other activities. It's about dual tasking early, early on. Okay? It's about, you know, using functional-specific sports. But you have to understand progression so you don't jump from point A to point B. You're doing you're going A, B, C, you're doing functional progression up that way. So the key is a progressively increasing cognitive demand while you're doing dynamic activity. Your actions you do have to be reflexive motor programs, not cognitive thinking. Because if you add the cognitive component into the physical activity, when you're doing it at the high, high, high level, you already lost. Okay? So I think the best activity you can do for cognitive high-level demand activity to keep the brain functioning and activity is mountain biking, right? If you're great mountain bikers, look ahead, see the line they're going to go to. They don't look at after that. Their body and the bike goes down the line they want, okay? They're looking way ahead for the next line to see what they have to do to turn. If they hit something and they start to get something feeling off a little bit, they, their body automatically adjusts to it. If you, if you think you're, if you start to, if, you, if you're back tire, you're going around a corner and you think you're going to take this line good and all of a sudden your back tire starts to slide out, you adjust your body weight or you grab your, 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 your brake and give a little bit of a tap of your brake to slow down the back end of your sliding out to prevent you from sliding out and dumping. Or you're starting to endo to go over. You didn't think you didn't hit this right. You're going down in the last second in the air. You're not thinking, oh, I am going to go over the front end of my handlebars. I need to pull up. You reflexively, actively do that. And you align your body and get yourself. It's a reflexive action from repetitive doing activity. And you cognitively have to keep moving down the line because if you're looking at what you're going over as a great mountain biker or a great mobile skier or a jump skier or a golfer, if you're thinking about the position your body needs to be in, you're already lost. If you're thinking, oh, man, I need to keep my elbow straight when my back, on my back swing and a golf and I need to lock my wrist in this position and I need to shift my weight, and you're thinking about that swing, you're lost. You, it has to be a feeling action that kicks in the motor program. Senses. Mechanoreceptor, what's the receptor receptor? The constant feedback. Oh, I need to change this a little bit. You have a motor program when you're mountain biking, you're going down, and your, your neural receptors feel you start to slide out, so you automatically shift your weight or put your hand on the outside handlebar. So when your front wheel starts to slide out, you, put, you, you take the hand off one side and put pressure on the other to get your front tire to grab the turn where you want to go. You don't do it thinking about it. You do it by a motor program and, and reflex it. So dual tasking, you know, consistently doing dual tasking. If you've got a shoulder exercise guy, you're doing dual tasking with, you know, having a stand in a bosu ball. That's a dual tasking activity. So this is my diatribe very quickly. I'll go through this. I think I, I, people love doing ladders, athletes doing ladders. I can't stand ladders. Because where in life, first of all, do you ever pat your feet really quick and move them around? You don't ever do that. And almost everybody, and these are just pictures I took off the Internet, and you can view high, high-level athletes. Whoever looks down at the ground at their feet when they're doing activity, if you're ever looking down at your feet, you've already been, you can't do that activity. You always have to be looking up. You should never be looking down. What are these people looking at? I don't know. There's my diatribe about ladders. Um, external cueing, this is a Dustin Grooms thing, and, and, and listen to some of Dustin's lectures if you can. External cueing versus internal cueing. You want external cueing so they don't say, don't turn your knees in. You want them to feel their knees turning out. So if you're doing lunges, if you're, so you're doing something like a, a, you know, a, a lunge and people's trunk leans over forward, instead of saying, don't lean your trunk over, keep your shoulders back, you say, I want you to look up to the ceiling and reach up to the sky. So you force them to reach completely up so it automatically feels their trunk rising. You're not telling them to keep their trunk up, internal or external cueing. And that's something really does some great presentations on that. One of the best ways to do external cueing and cognitive processing while you're moving information, that's what Tracer does. We have neuromechanical. We have math problems. They can be more complex. You can make them simpler. Which way to go? How quickly they go on and off the screen? How quickly you can process your know, information? How quickly your ocular motor can do something? When you're moving and watching it, that's vestibular ocular is managing it and watching it. So you get all, you, you work that. So um, you could do low-tech cost. You could do the same thing. If you, you know, don't have training, you can do it using flashcards, holding up flashcards. Lots of things you can do. Erickson's Flanker tests and Stroop tests are actually known neurocognitive tests that have been put in the that are put in the tracer. You can have 
you know, the discrete, these differences of these neurocognitive tests to really get people's, it, it really slows down your action time when you do it and, you're, and, and how quickly do you do it. So the NST on Tracer is, um, you know, is, is a test that's looking at uh, lateral motion, just reaction, pop-ups with flanker, and then diagonal. And if you talk to Gary, you know, Wilkerson has done a lot of study on this and things, the back diagonals are probably going to be the key because the key is going to be find yourself in space without looking where you're going because when you go back diagonal, you still have to look forward at the screen. You have to know the point where you're going to be. You have to hit your point, decelerate, move back forward without seeing that point on the ground, without knowing where you're going. You have to feel how far you're supposed to go and how quickly can you encode how far you have to go to get back quickly going back and forth. And can you do it the same amount of time or what's the distance between the time and reaction time between adding a neurocognitive component flanker versus a just built reaction time where it pops up. Those are the kind of things that you have to kind of train and work for. So again, you have to kind of, this is the process we want to work for. You want all these systems to be working together to get you to move and react the way you're supposed to do and you need to measure it. And I think that this is the future. We can measure this. Trace is the only thing I know they can measure. You can't measure it neurocognitively on a computer test. You can't do it with a stopwatch on a field. You have to kind of look for sway and look for those things. So I think this is where the, the information in the future is. And understanding this is not a linear process. These are all feedback loops. You have to work the feedback loops. You have to constantly be training these and getting them to have a, a motor program that's efficient. So um, there we go. Oh, that's my that's my end. Um, but before that, I'll leave it up for questions and discussion and and uh, more about this is the more described me right here. Right here. So, Hey, Randy, that's fantastic. Really appreciate it. It's hard to lead after you go into such uh, incredible science because uh, I certainly won't sound as smart, but we're going to jump over for about five quick minutes because I know we're limited on time and do a quick uh, question and answer following that. So everybody give me like, uh, give me about 30 seconds. I'll move into the lab and I will do a quick demo and then we'll jump into question and answers. Mm -hmm. Can they all see me? Fantastic. So hopefully everybody can see me okay and everybody can hear me all right. So I'm in our lab now. I'm just going to give a quick uh, five-minute sort of overview and touch on some of the points that Randy did, much less scientific, but uh, sort of just a broad uh, scope as to what we're doing here. So I'm going to start off. Real quickly, Tracer, a lot of you already know what it is, a lot don't. So some of this might be repetitive, but I think the overview will hopefully be beneficial when you see some of the new things that we're doing right now that are really exciting. Tracer, small hardware component with an optical camera on the front, driving the software and the virtual environment that you're going to see here in just a second, uh, all wrapped around the ability to objectively quantify human health and performance very uniquely based on two factors. Can we objectively quantify and provide actionable data in regards to that human health performance and that quantification of the status of that individual. Um, so there's four key pillars we'll look at. One being balance, which Randy talked quite a bit about, uh, dynamic balance. Two being kinematics. Can we look at form? Can we look at joint angles and, and rapidly objectively quantify? Three, looking at dynamic movement, putting you in an analogous environment and pre providing a reactive-based environment similar analogous to the real world, which we find to be vital. Looking at an individual or an athlete's ability to stop, start, and change direction, and how well do they do that? Can they see the environment, process information cognitively, and then move from a motor standpoint efficiently and effectively and symmetrically? And four, neuromechanics, and Randy's uh, presentation was all wrapped around these neuromechanical measures, and this is really the most exciting space for us. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on that here and showing you how we integrate cognitive challenges with movement to then splice out brain-related issues with mo motor issues, allowing us and those clinicians amongst the group to directly address where the issue might lie and then provide a more uh, clear and concise care path around those areas. So I'm going to jump in, again, limited time, but I'm going to look at one. I'm going to show you quickly the LAS, which Randy alluded to, very simple. And you'll see here, we've now included new environments that you can incorporate into any activity. So if you have a tennis player, I'm on a tennis court here. 
So you see the tennis court environment? It rapidly calibrates me, and within three seconds, I'm integrated. That's me. And I'm reacting left versus right. We're looking at how well I process that information and move from a motor standpoint. And we're looking at acceleration, decelerations, reaction times, left versus right, looking at speed, and then again, asymmetry. I'm not going to keep going because I won't be able to talk and I'll have a heart attack. Uh, but I wanted to give you a sense of what that looked like. I'm going to jump now into some, just some of the neuromechanical applications. I'm going to show you flanker. So on the flanker side in neuromechanics, very simple premise. Same exact movement pattern you just saw, reacting left and right, back to center, um, and then to the target. Here you'll see we added, there's five arrows across the top. So pay attention to the screen. Five arrows across the top. I'm focused on the center arrow. And they're either going to be congruent, all going the same direction, or incongruent, meaning they're all mixed up. Still, all I care about is that center arrow. Whatever direction that's pointing is the direction I'm going to move in. So it's pointing to the right. Great. So now we bring in a, a choice reaction time and some executive function looking at how well I can process that cognitive challenge and then move in the appropriate direction to solve the problem, basically. You see those arrows at the top? They flash in this current assessment at 500 milliseconds, but then you can turn into a training modality and you can decrease the time. Or for the senior population, for example, you can leave that stimulus on the screen static, so they might not process as fast, but as they get better and better and they have better wiring between that brain and body, then we can decrease the amount of time that stimulus stays on the screen for them to process that information. All right. Already out of breath. All right, quickly I'll show you the Stroop. The Stroop, if, if anybody's not aware of what the Stroop is, highly validated uh, neuropsych test, again, used uh, a lot of times in the stroke um, or the senior community, again, looking at brain processing. We've included that with movement. So I'm focused on the color. So if it says blue, I'm moving to blue. That was red, but it was in blue. So I'm going to the word, not the color. You can tell I'm already having a little bit of a challenge with that. The word. Good. And again, we can put them on any environment. So it could be a hockey rink, a football field, a tennis court. But we want it to be analogous to where that person is returning to. The closer that can be, we think the better the outcomes might be. Lastly, I'm going to show you kinematics. Um, and kinematics is new. And this is looking here just at a double leg squat. And rather than using an avatar, we're now using just the individual. You'll see it overlays the joints in the body. We'll calibrate me quickly. I go ahead and begin my squats. Here's going to be 10 reps. You can see the biofeedback on the right side of the screen. Good. And then it will automatically give me a kinematic output. So we can rapidly insert somebody into the environment, immediately get a kinematic output, and then compare and contrast longitudinally over time. So what's the best way to do work with this data? I won't go into any you know, depth in the detail. But what it allows us to do, we can baseline somebody whether they're injured or whether they're healthy, and then consistently reassess throughout the life cycle, let's say physical therapy, for example, or in the training room, looking hopefully that degradation and deficiency throughout the life cycle of their rehabilitation period, or we're looking at somebody on the performance side, we can track overtraining, overreaching, and degradations due to those two things, or just look at performance enhance enhancements over a linear time frame. Uh, so quickly, I think that's uh, about as much time as we have for this. I'm going to jump back into uh, the office and let uh, Randy do some question and answer with the team that's on the call. Thank you. So Randy, I'm just uh, looking for some questions that people might have. But uh, in the meantime, what do you really think about ladders? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I need to. Uh, I, I, I keep now that I've said that to a bunch of people. Anytime some high-level athletes put on their their uh, their Instagram that they did ladders, I always get pictures of them from people saying they're looking at their feet. You know. Yeah. 
Does anybody have any uh, any any questions for either Randy or for our team? Um, we've got a couple minutes left here. Wanted to make sure that we gave uh, an open platform for everybody to get their questions answered if they have any. Yeah, nothing. Impressive. Hey, well, Randy, I've, I've got well, I've got. I put, I must have put everybody to sleep. So. Was that? I said I must have put everybody to sleep. <laughs> Is everybody asleep? Uh, baseline testing and trade to function uh, returns. So, Kristen Millett says, uh, "Do we see any? Uh, do you see any of your programs moving to baseline testing with the tracer to assist with uh, function return to sport after any injury?" And uh, Kristen, yeah, from our perspective, absolutely. I think that um, it has a broad use, and I'm gonna let Randy give his two cents here in a second. But obviously, broad use, and I think we see far more orthopedic injuries and far more use with trays around the orthopedic side because of that, looking at lower extremity function, for example, um, in addition to sort of the concussion baselining components. But what's so unique about trays, Kristen, as you might or might not know, is the ability to look at that holistic system and look at both brain function and musculoskeletal function simultaneously, as well as a number of other factors, cardiorespiratory health, for example. Uh, but Randy, do you want to talk a little bit about your personal uh, experience on that side and how you might correlate yeah. to you? Yeah, I would get away from that. I, I think we need to overall get away from the quote term baseline testing, right? It, it's all about, um, and this is Dust, this is a Jeff Kucher thing, you know, if you're talking about concussions, you should have the neural portion of your, your PPE. You should do a PPE and your PPE should should be, your pre presentation exam should look for risk factors um, and things that you could possibly have interventions on. Or, or And so part of the, um, you know, part of that, you know, part of you know, using a, you know, using a device like this or a technology, maybe has to be. Can you get information from it? You can make changes, or get information from it that you might need later on, right? You don't want to do anything if, in a, in, in a, with an athlete early on that isn't going to help you. So I think that you know, doing this, if you can find asymmetries right to left, um, you, if you have true asymmetries right to left. That does one of two things. One, it could put you at risk for some kind of injury, um, um, and, and that we, we need to see that. We're, we're going to look at that. We need to look at that data, and I know Gary Wilkerson is. And then the second thing it looks at: can you do something to intervene to actually make them a better athlete and make them you can prevent them from being risk of an injury? So if you have a true asymmetry right to left on cognitive processing and moving your, your body, you're, you, are you going to be an athlete that isn't, is good doing something right to left? And you really want symmetries. And so, you know, so I think that looking for this as, a, as part of your, your physical exam to look for things that you can intervene to help problems, I think that's part of the future. So. No, that's great. And then, yeah, yeah. and what about well, young athlete, youngest athlete who views them? I know you have yeah, some kids that, using them out so, there. Um, well, I was, just, I was just laughing my head off the other day, and I'll – I'll probably post something like this on social media, but I have my brother's four-year-old who's a little midget running around and just and killing it. So it, it will track, um, you know, I've seen as young as four, maybe even three. I wouldn't claim that that could be uh, used. You know, I don't know if you call a four-year-old an athlete, even though I think he will be one day. Uh, but usually it's, you know, above eight years old. Uh, I think most groups we've talked to uh, usually use it with 10-year-olds or above. Uh, but it just depends on the motor function of that individual and, and you know, how, you know, how far in the uh, evolutionary path they are as far as their growth and maturity uh, to a great extent. Hey, Randy, how about, uh, how about frequency of testing in terms of trying to monitor, act, you know, the asymmetries and the levels, you know, through the course of a season or a year? I mean, how, how frequently should you be? Reass reassessing or rechecking up on these on your athletes well I, I would i would say your 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 assessment should be pretty consistent if, if you're using it to train you don't need to necessarily assess because part of your you just evaluate your your treatment that you're using the device you're using tracer for right so you consistently are looking for you know when you're when you're when you're using it for training you can look at it if you want to you know if you're talking about kind of just retesting to test uh, you know, I think it's it's just it's it's a good tool to use at post injury. So you look at somebody before you're returning them, um, and uh, you know, as part of the early portion of the the evaluation, and then um, and then when you're when you're really kind of working them back. 
But when you're using it as a, a as part of your treatment tool, then you can just assess your treatment your, your treatment how it's going there, and you can look at all the data on that too. Good, fantastic. Well, we want to respect everyone's time, so I want to you know first of all thank you, Randy, for doing this and invaluable at least for us to hear your perspective. Hopefully for the rest of the group as well. Uh, we appreciate you being here, man, and taking this time. I know how swamped you are. Uh, thank you, everyone.